This is my HP Omen gaming laptop. This bad boy is a 2020 model, making it between 4 and 5 years old, and it's sporting a Ryzen 4800H with 16GB of DDR4-3200 RAM, and importantly here, an RTX 2060 laptop GPU with 6GB of VRAM. Considering I mostly use this for programming these days, I want to know how well that 2060 holds up for gaming, and to no one's surprise, it's hell of a lot better than the other older machines that I've checked out recently. Let's take a look. At 1080p, the display's resolution, in CS2 on low settings, you can expect perfectly playable performance. I got around 98 FPS average playing against bots, which means that in a more real game with like players rather than bots running on the CPU, you should expect a touch more. That does mean that it's considerably closer to the older machines than to the high spec comparison, the Strix Scar 16 with its RTX 4080 and 3980HX, but it's nothing to sniff at. In Rainbow Six Siege, it's better, 142 FPS average. That's still again closer to zero than it is to the Scar, which was actually tested on medium settings. But still, 142 FPS on low is more than playable, and actually leaves room for higher settings if you'd prefer, although we'll get back to that in a second. As for Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's actually con a considerable bit ahead of the Nitro 5's RX 560 at 86 FPS versus 49 FPS average, although the Scar still does run ahead on the highest preset even versus the lowest for the rest of them. Hell, even the 1% lows are actually higher than the average on the 2060, but as I've said in these videos, this isn't exactly a fair fight. It's just a point of comparison. Now, seeing as this machine can actually run some intensive games with reasonable performance, I've included Cyberpunk and Hitman here too. Cyberpunk first. On medium settings, nets 54 FPS average, which, considering it's damn Cyberpunk, really isn't bad. I mean, it's about half the performance of the Scar, but even when it was new, it was well under half the price, if not a third, so it's hard to argue the performance here. It's plenty playable, if a little cinematic at times, but that's fine. Hitman shows quite the performance delta. The GPU data anyway from the built-in benchmark really shows the difference, with the 4080 and the SCAR running away with 255 FPS average compared to just 66 FPS on the 2060, but 66 FPS is still plenty playable and a decent enough experience. I mentioned earlier about being able to play on higher settings on this thing, and that's definitely the case. Even just looking at Siege and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, pumping those up to medium settings hardly impacts the performance in a super significant way while giving you a decent bit more visual quality. Sure, for Siege it might be worth keeping it on low if you want to be as competitive as possible, although let's face it, this isn't exactly a pro esports machine, so you certainly wouldn't be in the wrong for trading a few FPS for some more visual quality. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a game where you really can't get a sort of competitive advantage, at least in the sort of conventional esports sense, so trading 86 FPS for 70, but much better visual quality, feels like a worthy trade-off to me. Being able to run above minimum settings while still retaining a playable experience is a really good sign for the gaming experience health of this thing. Oh, and if you're wondering about that 4800H, according to Cinebench anyway, it's actually pretty decent. 1200 points in single thread and just shy of 10,000 points in multi-threaded isn't bad, considering a much newer 3980HX isn't du even double that in the single threaded performance and has twice the threads as this thing, so yeah, I think that's pretty decent. Blender has it taking just under 4 minutes for the BMW scene and a bit over 21 minutes for the Gooseberry scene. Obviously compared to the SCAR that's still pretty slow, but compared to all of the other older machines that I've tested, it's light years ahead. It also only drew around 45 watts as well, at least on the CPU package, which is mighty compre impressive compared to the 126.5 watts the SCAR sucks back. In fact, 
it'd actually be really cool to see how the 3980HX would do at a 45 watt power limit compared to this thing. Sadly, I don't have that SCAR anymore to run more tests on, but if I can get my hands on something like it, I'd like to give it a try. One thing I actually haven't mentioned in these videos that I think is worth noting about these older machines is their poor connectivity. In this machine's case, the I.O. itself is actually pretty decent. It has USB 3, dual Type-C ports with one of them doing DisplayPro Alt mode, HDMI, Ethernet, SD card reader, combo headphone jack, and DC in, which is actually a marked upgrade over all of the older machines for sure, although this still suffers from relatively slow Wi-Fi. I mean, this one in particular is decent enough. It's a Realtek 8822CE chip, which means that it does 802.11ac for around 600 megabits per second, but compared to newer AX, Wi-Fi 6E, and Wi-Fi 7 stuff, this is positively dark ages. Considering I have gigabit internet in my home and, at very least, Wi-Fi 6E support, this cannot saturate my internet connection that's kind of a fail to me. One area that does improve though every time that I jump to a newer machine is the display. Finally, we have a higher than 60 hertz refresh rate display. This is a 144 hertz IPS panel, which I just had to test with my response time tool, my open source response time tool, available at osrt.com, link in the description. And yeah, it's, it's not great. It averaged out to 11 milliseconds, which is not too far off twice the refresh rate window, meaning this is actually a, what, 89 hertz display or panel that's being marketed as 144 hertz one. You can see the ghosting on the high speed footage too. Although, in the grand scheme of things, it really isn't all that bad, especially compared to a lot of the other laptops that I've tested over the years. It is also considerably more vibrant and bright than most too, and a damn sight better than the rest of the older machines in this series. This is actually a pretty great experience to use day to day. Honestly, the overall user experience here is still fantastic. It has plenty of power for programming. The keyboard is actually pretty decent. It's nicely backlit too. Uh, the trackpad is decently sized with all the gestures you'd expect. And as I said, the display is a pretty nice thing to look at, even if it isn't quite as fast as it should be. Of course, the main question I was hoping to answer here is, is the 2060 still good enough for gaming? And the answer I think is a resounding, yeah. I mean, sure, you're not getting hundreds of FPS basically anywhere, but most games that you throw at it will be playable if nothing else. It isn't a powerhouse, and you aren't going to be playing at high settings on most stuff, but then you weren't going to when it was new either, so I think this is still a great choice for a starter machine, or if you already have one, you can rest assured that it's still good enough. Of course, those are my thoughts, but I'd love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think about an RTX 2060 laptop GPU in basically 2025? Uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you want to check out my open source response time tool, the thing that I use to test displays like this, then head over to osrt.com, linked in the description. Of course, if you want to see more videos like this one, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell, and check out the rest of the old machine series on the end cards too. Otherwise, that's kind of it. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.